the action in Fairy Creek started last August, so almost a year ago. And it was a, a small group of people who realized that this, this forest was at risk of being logged. Uh, and they have been occupying it ever since. It's an evolution of a movement that began with a group of hikers that uh, hiked up to the mountains there in, in the hills of Vancouver Island and saw the forest before them and knew that they had to save it. And so from that tiny little hiking group, it's grown to save the Fairy Creek movement and now to the Flying Rainforest Squad movement, which is, which is a, a bigger perspective and, and it seems to be growing by leaps and bounds still, it's still evolving. Fairy Creek is situated between Pachidat, Dididat and the Hupitsit, I believe, which is a portion of uh, Banfield, Port Alberni. And so uh, the Dididat people are you know, really close to Nitnat Lake, and then the Pachidat people are close to Port Renfrew. So um, the uh, forestry that we're talking about is situated between the three nations and also um, situated right next door to the Carmano Walbrin, um, you know, rainforest. So in, in southern Vancouver Island, there are some protected areas, Carmana and, and the lower Walbrand Valley, the upper Walbrand isn't protected. And those are areas we fought for in the early 90s. They're not very accessible to people though. You have to really drive a, a long ways on, on some rough logging roads to get to them. Ferry Creek is just off of a main uh, highway here between Lake Couch and, and Port Renfrew. It's, you know, 15 minute drive from Port Renfrew in the Pachidat village. And today I'm coming to you from Grandma Tree. This tree is thousands of years old. And just one example of the last remaining 2.7% of old growth forest left in British Columbia and on Vancouver Island. We have, you know, captured, I think, the imagination of, of the BC public and, and as well as uh, attracted attention around the world now. This is an indigenous movement, um, yet the politics and the divide and conquer with colonial style governing has created a um, some hindrance to that and it's now, the message is now getting out. I want to acknowledge that we're on unceded Dididat and Pachidat land uh, and we're here by invitation of one of the hereditary leaders, um, uh, Victor Peter. I'm here to protect all my territory, to represent my culture, to bring back our traditional stuff. We're slowly bringing it back. I'm, happy, I'm proud of it. My name is uh, Victor Peter. It's in my bloodline, so it's been, I'm the fourth generation of the being hereditary chief. I'm trying to protect my territory, where all are. So I'm thanking everyone that's out here, all around the other camps. Thanks for your support. The Pachidat and the Dididat's land, um, we were welcomed onto by Elder Bill Jones. This is his traditional hunting and fishing um, area. We are actually there. Uh, holding our camps at the invitation of Elder Bill Jones. He's a member of the Pachadat First Nations. Our chief invites us all to this land. First Nations have free access to their land and they can have guests on their land. William Jones of the Pachadat First Nation, um, 81 years old. I'm uh, here to uh, more or less reflect not direct um, the uh, wishes and hopes and dreams of the uh, Rainforest Flying Squad. I don't pretend to be their leader. I at, am at times called their elder. My concern is that we have very little old growth left. And that is my main concern and my only objective in this conflict. I'm Kathy Code. I'm a spokesperson for the Rainforest Flying Squad. Gaila Kesla, Nuku Am Rainbow Eyes. Hi, uh, my name is Rainbow Eyes. I'm a member of the Danakdao Awitlala First Nation. Our traditional territory is Night Inlet. 
It's Rose Henry, and I come from the Klaaman Nation. Yeah, it's Sergeant Eleanor Sturko. I'm a police officer, but what I'm tasked to do is to be a conduit, a liaison between the media, um, other people who are here, documentarians. Sonia first know. I'm the MLA for the amazing traditional territory and unceded territory of Cowichan tribes in Malahat, and known as the Cowichan Valley and I'm also the leader of the BC Green Party. Yeah, Adam Olson. I'm the MLA for Sandwich North in the Islands. Um, I'm a member of the Sartlet Village in the uh, Satanish Territory, which uh, we're in here. I'm Paul Manley. I'm the Member of Parliament for Nanaimo Ladysmith. My name is Alistair McGregor. I am the Member of Parliament for Couch and Malahat Langford. My name is Natalie Chambers. I'm a farmer at Madrona Farm, and I'm also a Sandwich Councillor. Noah Ross. I'm a movement lawyer and civil litigator. So I work with uh, social movements and uh, I do litigation. I'm Sage. Um, I'm Nuchal Nuth and I'm Heltzik, so from Bella Bella and Yakulet. My name is Pamela Leela. We are Amazon North and people don't realize that, that these forests um, actually sequester more carbon than the Amazon. Um. They're great teachers, but there's a real sense of wonder and wisdom in those trees. You only need to take a trip out to Port Renfrew and take uh, a walk through some of those groves to feel just absolute wonder at what you're walking through. Like to, to learn about the, the percentage that's left of the trees and these amazing massive trees that people come from all over the world to see and then there's so little left of them. The old growth trees, you know, they mean life. It is very much ingrained as a part of my culture that, you know, the sacred uh, trees are there for, you know, protecting us. Trees, not only do they protect us, but they also provide the oxygen and the necessary, you know, supplements to allow life to continue on. The trees are calling out for us to come and support, and support in any way we can. We're in a time now where we have a, a crash in biodiversity. We're in a mass extinction moment. We're facing a climate crisis. These ancient trees, you look at the size of the tree on, and, and the ring around that tree is the amount of carbon that was captured in that year. And you think about the size of that tree and, the, and you know how, how big it is in diameter, how much carbon it's capturing is acres and acres of seedlings. To me, it seems like a simple solution to leave trees standing that act as carbon sinks because um, there's scientific evidence that these massive, gigantic trees are far more effective than second growth trees in sequestering carbon. Compared to how much carbon that tree will soak up in a day is almost the size of my life form. The value of those trees as our future seed banks what they contribute to as far as retaining water, as preventing fires. There's, there's, a, there's a scientific list that goes on and on and on. You can't cut down old growth and then replant cedar trees and think that it's gonna have the same effect on the environment and be able to take in the same amount of carbon that it's doing now. That tree, say it's 1500 years old. If we take from the ice age till now, it may be only the eighth generation of that tree. So if you think about the timeline of like the entire ecology of the forest and you know they're moving like they're doing their own form of traveling but it's in this time scale that we can't even fathom. Well the old growth forest in the fair is part of the last some of the last temperate uh, rainforest on the world. We are in a global habitat crisis, a global climate crisis and um, all of the uh, native vegetation that lives in an old growth needs to have a place to live. You can't just take the vegetation that's old growth vegetation and wildlife and put it in a primary forest. It just doesn't work. These are non-renewable forests. You cut them down, they will never return. We, we have to save them. There's so much biodiversity contained within them, we don't even know everything that is in them. They are also really significant and crucial for our, our climate change crisis. Um, they are what will save us from ourselves. It's like Narnia meets the Wizard of Oz. It's, there's an energy there and there's just a feeling, just a pervasive experience of rightness. Grandpa said that. He said the forest is a place where our spirits from the past 
present and future flow through each other. And you don't know when or who you're meeting in the forest. And the magic is real. I mean, it's no coincidence that we're saving Fairy Creek. It's no coincidence um, that we're here. The company in question is Teal Jones. It is the largest privately owned logging company in British Columbia, run by Tom and Dick Jones, the brother CEOs. They hold the tree farm license number 46, TFL 46, which gives them the legal right through the contracts with the British Columbia government to log all of the old growth in the Ferry Creek blockade zone. There is a really entrenched resource industry, unfortunately, in BC. And like, you know, a lot of society is geared towards supporting those entrenched interests to keep on extracting unfortunately. And then we have corporations like Teal Jones and Western Forest Products who are saying we need those trees to keep living. Well, you know, we all need those trees, but we need the trees to stay alive. So, you know, like I wish that, you know, Teal Jones and Western Forest Products and every other forest industry would take a few lessons from the First Nations people who, you know, have never taken more than what they needed. We are on the, the end game of an industry that um, has had the, and still has the um, motto of here today, here today, gone tomorrow. You look at the... Uh Kagkeese River, they want to log it to the riverbanks. You know, fish bearing streams, everybody's talking, oh, we got to do this for the salmon and that, but then the logging companies want to log right to the banks. And I mean right to the banks. You'd look at all the small streams up here, there's no buffer zones. The uh, government is supposed to be um, conciliating or, re or are helping both sides of the uh, conflict to um, settle amicably, but um, it, it all stacks towards the, the logging companies. So he called an election on September 21st. Um, up until that day, uh, there had been a minority government in British Columbia and the, the government was an NDP government led by John Horgan and the balance of power was uh, the BC Green Party. I had won the leadership race on September 14th, exactly one week before that election was called. And I think this is really important to recognize under a first-past-the-post system, it was a perfect political reason to call an election. They were ahead in the polls, uh, governments tend to do well in crises that they appear to be managing effectively and they took advantage of the fact that they had a, a bump in the polls and they wanted a majority and they did what two other minority governments in Canada did and which we probably are going to see the federal government do shortly which is seize power. John Horgan got his majority government that he was looking for uh, when he called the snap election during the pandemic. The BC Greens retained the two seats that we had. And what the NDP did, which is what's very typical of them, is they, they you know, commissioned a, a review. And they got two foresters and um, they produced what's well known as the Old Growth Strategic Review, and they were the panel. And that review has 14 recommendations. Eventually he committed to implementing all 14 recommendations of the old growth review panel. And people believed him because this is an issue that really matters to a lot of British Columbians, as you know. They've really put ahead a uh, recommendation number one, which is relationships with Indigenous people. As an Indigenous person, I'm not going to complain about that. That's something that we should be doing all the time. But to think that those recommendations came in a chronological order uh, is, is just not the case. There are uh, recommendation number six is the immediate deferral of, of high-risk ecosystems. Uh, you know, if, if you wait to do all of the other things first, those ecosystems are going to be gone because we're going to continue to cut them. What we've seen since the election and, and over the past many months is a lot of language and, you know, we're, we are going to implement these recommendations and we are doing our consultations and yet on the ground they have issued 
a significant number of new permits for logging old growth. They are ignoring First Nations who have been loudly calling for deferrals on their territories, and they are really allowing business as usual to go and uh, for these trees and forests to come down. Listen to the report. The report came out. It said exactly what we need to do. We already knew that. They hired some people to say it, and it came out. How much did we spend on that? I don't know. Why are we not doing that? The government won't actually follow its own advice. So now regular citizens are coming here, getting arrested. And that's why is that our job? Like we elected the NDP to follow through with these policy changes that they said they would do. And they're not doing it. And now we're forced to come to it for them. When the provincial government won't listen, then this is what happens. The movement is asking here for a moratorium on old growth logging. Uh, we asked to apply the 14th recommendation on the old growth review that was uh, passed last year. So we just we want to save those old growth trees. There's only 2.7% left, so we cannot afford to cut them. We're in our 11th month of uh, holding camps. We've been in, holding the camps through the, the BC winter and now through the BC sweltering heat wave. I mean, some of us, of course, have been through this before, right? Uh, the war in the woods is not new. We were at this point back in the 90s. I feel like this particular movement at this particular time is giving people permission to do things that they normally maybe wouldn't have, um, myself included. Like, I've always kind of been on the periphery of this kind of thing, and um, I guess it was just my time. I don't know if it's my age or where I'm standing in life or whatever, but finally I was like, oh, I can actually, like, the only thing that will make any difference is if we rabble rouse and make enough noise. As soon as you hear about it, environmentally, or you hear it from a friend, you, you want to be there, you want to do something that has a bit of a purpose in life. I wanted to be part of this movement that is so much more than the old growth trees, uh, but is about decolonization and uh, standing for, for the earth and the indigenous land that we are on. I'm a retired uh, warden uh, from Vancouver Island Regional Correctional Centre, so I spent uh, just short of 30 years in the public service and um, the last 15 years in corrections and being the warden. And I've seen such injustice to Indigenous peoples in our system and this is just a further uh, the extension of what we've done and the position we've put them in and we have to stand up and support that. Uh, never mind, never mind to talk about you know, the destitution of something that will never, ever, ever replace, not in my lifetime, not in anybody's lifetime. I just think that's so sad. This is actually the first time that I'm doing direct action uh, on a blockade like this, so it's kind of exciting for me a little bit. I suppose a big deal is that so many other people care. I wouldn't have known about it if other people didn't care about it. For me, it's much more than just old growth. It's for Indigenous sovereignty, Indigenous rights, human rights, land rights. Got talking with Bill Jones and like he said, the forests are a representation of the people. And it is. Just my right as an Indigenous child of the land to protect the land and my ancestors, to carry on the work and the culture um, for the seven generations, to protect the land for seven generations ahead of us. I think this is an opportunity, like one of few where people actually uh, have access to a, a blockade where direct action is needed. Everything is needed, everyone is needed, and it's amazing to see how it's coming together. And we still need those people because there's so much turnover and that works in favor of the police. We need a constant flow of people and we need every single person and this fight is going to go on for a long time. As April 1st, uh, Justice Verhoeven in issued an uh, interim injunction uh, for a period of six months uh, that prohibits, um, it prohibits basically interfering with Teal Jones's forestry activities within uh, the injunction zone, which is uh, a large portion of Southwest Vancouver Island that's largely continuous with their tree farm license that they hold, tree farm license 46. The first obstacle that we encountered was the injunction hearing itself, where Justice Verhoeven, I, I guess through case precedent, um, whatever, um, 
said that the only thing that he could consider then was that Teal Jones has a signed agreement with government. And that's all he needed to know to approve the injunction against us. Nothing else mattered. It didn't matter that it was against the public interest. It didn't matter that you know climate change is upon us. But in the meantime, though, this injunction allows Teal Jones the right to log. And we know that it's the minute that we leave those camps, um, that they will be in there logging as fast as they can. It's also worth noting that Justice Verhoeven was a senior litigator and partner at Edwards, Kennedy & Bray, a law firm that specializes in helping industry reach their goals, specifically the mining and the forestry industry. We're gonna to talk to about injunctions generally first and the way that um, industry uses courts to get injunctions to protect their interests but governments often leave the public interest for the public to defend, and the public can feel very alone in that situation, and, and Ferry Creek is a, an example of this. The government has a duty and a responsibility in this, and they are ignoring that, and they are shielding their, their abandonment of this issue by having the, the company go get the injunction. The government issued the permits. The government can put deferrals on those permits. The government can revoke those permits. And so they actually have the power to solve this and they are sitting back and not using that power. Uh, really, th this injunction is a, is a legal mechanism to be able to clear the land of any um, objection to Crown forestry policy. We are now nearing the end of the second month of RCMP enforcement. Uh, our will has not wavered at all. We are still determined to save the, the trees and the forest. We're an impartial party to this. Um, we're not pro-industry, we're not against industry, we're not pro-protest, we're not against it. We've been tasked by the court to do um, the function of enforcing that injunction. So I think sometimes too people see police as being in an adversarial role and it's difficult for us. When that court injunction was handed down, you know, the police don't really have an option when a court uh, presents them with an order. So the Supreme Court um, issued an injunction for the logging company, Teal Jones, that they should be able to do their logging according to their license within this area. The injunction was to prevent people from impeding them with doing their duty. And it had a clause in it that stipulates that police can help enforce that injunction. So the enforcement that we're doing is that we are clearing the roadway of people who are obstructing. So they're in breach of that court injunction by not leaving the area when asked to do so, impeding industry and impeding police in the execution of their lawful duty. In that area, there's several activities that are prohibited. You can't interfere with their logging um, activities or with the movement of vehicles. And so um, a lot of the arrests, probably well over 200, are for a breach of that injunction where people have been interfering with vehicles, um, allegedly, or interfering with Teal Jones's ability to harvest, so being on the road, um, typically. I think you've articulated very well that you try to remain a neutral uh, party within all of this, but there are certainly some who would argue that the police have become militarized in acting on behalf of a private corporation. How would you respond to, the, respond to that claim? Well, we're actually carrying out our duty as is imposed by the court. So um, as Canadians and as industries, they can go to the court to request an injunction, to ask for an exception, to ask for assistance to carry out their uh, lawful duties, what they're doing. It is the role of the police to do what is ordered by the court. Are the police being used as a private military force for Teal Jones? <laughs> oh yeah, my instinct right away says yes. Them saying, well, you know, like, they're paying me to be here. And I'm like, so are we, you know? Like, we pay the same taxes. And, you know, we deserve just as much protection from the corporations as the corporations need from us, right? Police, honestly, they get paid a lot of money and they're hand-picked and kind of super soldiered out, in my opinion, um, to becoming these almost automaton enforcers of whoever is higher up in the chain of command. 
What we've seen this provincial government do multiple times now is use the RCMP as a way to enforce uh, um, the, the corporate rights that the provincial government grants through its tenuring system, really. You know, they auction off these cut blocks. They give the, the corporate interests the rights to, to go and extract uh, all of the economic value off of it. If you want access to this and we've got protesters there, then you have to go get an injunction. And so they go get an injunction and then in comes the RCMP doing what the RCMP has done on behalf of the Canadian government and on behalf of corporate interests since the RCMP started hundreds of years ago. This is exactly how the RCMP has operated over the years. They have been used to clear the land of any interest that stands in the way of the Crown's desire to harvest as much of the natural resources at whatever pace it chooses to harvest them. And um, it, the RCMP was used to, to clear the land of Indigenous people by bringing them to residential schools. What is the role of publicly funded police in a situation like this? And again, the oversight on who's interpreting how this injunction is being uh, used uh, by, the, by the police in this case. And why are they being allowed to do this? I think these are really, really important questions and, and I'm, I'm really concerned. I really am. Sure, so at different points and at different places within the in injunction zone, the RCMP uh, have created what we call exclusion zones. They sometimes call temporary access control points, um, but they prohibit vehicle traffic sometimes or sometimes just uh, any access to areas and because the access out there is by logging road there's only a few points of entry um, the RCMP have denied access to large portions of that area which includes um, a lot of uh, parks and uh, important sites and beautiful old growth and yeah it's a vast areas of land yeah, right now it's considered the exclusion zone. Yeah, uh, you it's are an arbitrary zone. It's always shifting depending on how they feel or if there's equipment coming and going. You know, as soon as we showed up here, there was a pol police line, do not cross uh, tape put up, and we were told we're at the exclusion zone, and if we went any further, we'd be arrested. How many arrests have there been to date, do you know? Um, about 330 now to date. It's been just over 400. Uh, I think I think we crossed 400 in the last couple of days. There have now been over 500 arrests at Ferry Creek with no end in sight. Yeah, I've uh, been arrested once already. The arrests have been fine because as I'm arrested, I understand when I'm arrested and I'm docile like a beautiful jellyfish. I have been very fortunate that my arrest was very, it was probably the best arrest anybody could want. Uh, I was very lucky that there was a lot of media around and but like a week later we hear about people being bruised being handled so roughly when there is no media around. So they grabbed me personally from the crowd they put me on the ground pulled me over and brought me in the paddy wagon while I was yelling I'm a police liaison I'm a minor and yeah I still have bruises like almost two weeks after. The police grabbed my arm and he said, you're under arrest. And then the next thing I knew, I was just on the ground. And just like he was so angry. We're impartial, we're here to carry out a job, but we're trying to do it with as much compassion as possible. They are reacting to our to our protesters with, with um, harm and brutality. You might have seen the video of Katie on the bridge and Dom, and I mean Dom getting slammed down over a log with his wrenching his head back and then slammed on the ground like from the collar. And Katie being like thrown up against the bus after not even making physical contact with any officers, he just grabs her by the hair and forces her down and for absolutely no reason. And there is a young guy who was up in a hard block up at Waterfall Camp just a couple days ago and he's in a tripod which essentially means he's up, elevated off the ground. And as part of, uh, in order to make it harder for police to get to him, they were super careless with an excavator in trying to, to bring the, cut, the legs down. And he basically collapsed, like the leg collapsed or slid out sideways. And he went 
boom, sideways into the rock face. He had a serious like gash in his head, like bleeding. He went to the hospital. We have entered, it seems, a, a new phase where the, the RCMP acting on behalf of industry that got this injunction through the courts is applying to their actions a, a level of force and a level of control um, over people who are who should not be experiencing that. I have been looking at the creative ways that protesters have been setting up blockades and, and you have to admire the ingenuity uh, because the, the passion that's leading to that is quite incredible. I am worried about the safety though because a lot of people, um, you know, through the devices that they're using either to put their arms in the ground or put themselves up on those tripods, it can be an extremely tricky situation when you're using that heavy machinery to try and, and dismantle uh, either the arm lock in the ground or the or the tripod. So I'm always very concerned about the, the human safety part of it. So we have uh, special teams here with us. We have a team whose sole specialty is actually dealing with um, removing people from devices that they put around themselves into the ground, into trees, to make sure that um, the specialists are able to extract them safely. We also have our emergency response team here because they're experts and very skilled at things like high angle rescue. So we don't hold back any stops when it comes to safety. You know, my arrest was particular, like the, uh, the excavator was driving up 60 kilometers an hour, like the, that Reed Road, right up Reed Road and moving all these rocks. And it's, it's actually one of the worst sounds you can actually possibly like wake up to. And then there's just the fact that so many of these arrests or more so detainments are just catch and release and they're being taken back to Lake Cowichan and in many cases released without ever having to sign anything because the police are openly aware that it's this, this isn't an illegal this is not a legal exclusion zone. I was actually released with um, with the capacity to come back because my arrest the, the police affidavit wasn't clear enough for, for the judge to, to sort of think that I was actually in breach of the injunction. I was charged with obstruction for obstructing a police line, an illegal police line. And as I was walking away, I was like, I didn't get a court date. I didn't have to be fingerprinted. I wasn't read anything. I wasn't served any papers. And I think even women who were asked to have um, women cops detain them weren't granted that right. Being a female, you were legally allowed to ask for a female officer to arrest you. And I was denied that. I was demanding for a female officer and they denied me that right. I'm nervous when you're uh, a little surrounded by uniform and um, you're not totally sure if they're within their jurisdiction. Um, where a lot of people who don't totally understand all of the laws and rights and that's something that I've learned a lot in the past few days. It's confusing and I am scared because they do lie and they tell you the worst case scenario because they want you to stop. It's incentive to stop to keep the flow of the money going. Yeah the police are definitely using manipulation tactics and telling you lies about the conditions for your release. They are they are sharing that like basically like if you don't sign it might be four days that you're held in a cell before you get to see a judge, which is, which is a lie. I am a little bit freaked out because of how I'm spoken to by the police. This is coming from being arrested today and sitting in the paddy wagon and feeling mixed feelings of being a criminal. Which know your rights, because I feel like so many people don't know their rights. Um, so know your rights going into it. Um, and just stay calm and remember that it's a peaceful protest because Fear is the real virus in, in this situation, and love always wins. Would you do it again? 100%. <laughs>
longer than any other nationality for standing up. You know, with the police, I'm, I was, I've been there when the police have, you know, surrounded everybody and um, they started picking through the crowd who they were going to target and the police have become very famous for tar uh, targeting indigenous people. When you get beaten up four times in your life uh, by cops, you know, you don't really uh, develop a, an outstanding love for any policeman <laughs> with uh, the, the, the distrust that the cops have earned with First Nations here. An Indigenous elder who goes by Lady Chainsaw. She's in a wheelchair and she is a very inspiring woman. She's been arrested 54 times. Now I think it's 56. She's in a wheelchair because of police brutality. So she can no longer walk because the police have beaten her up so bad. And we've seen this over and over, time and time again, being like indigenous people being the first ones to be targeted for whatever kind of physical violence at a checkpoint or a blockade. What I heard happened to one of our BIPOC youth last night, um, where he had fallen, they had knocked him out of the tripod, and he ended up with a really severe concussion in the hospital. Myself and one other girl were the only girls of color. And something that I might add in there, uh, when I was being arrested and I was on the ground, uh, my friend, who is a female and who has darker skin, darker hair, she was pushed to the ground by the cops and dragged by her collar. And so I was screaming at them saying, stop, like this is so unnecessary, like stop being so rough with her. And they just kept pulling her. And I was just like, literally both of us are the darker skin girls um, in this group and they were the roughest with us. I've spoken with other protesters who have made allegations against police conduct, uh, specifically that people have been arrested and then left, uh, specifically people of indigenous descent or um, people who identify as black indigenous people of color have been arrested and then rather than being brought to station have been left in the road by themselves. Have you heard of any of these incidents and how would you respond to those claims? I haven't heard any of those claims but you know that certainly wouldn't be a part of our um, procedure. It's not part, I was at the briefing about how we are to treat people, where what our process for processing individuals who we arrest are. Um, and to release people, for example. Sometimes people are brought back to cells and released there or held in custody depending on the circumstance. Sometimes they're released at the site. A person could be released here and also released here. They were just like, you're just going to be dropped off somewhere. So we were like, okay, where are we going? They're like, somewhere in Port Renfrew. And then we're like, okay, well, it's getting late, so can you actually please tell us where we're going to be dropped off? And so one of the cops finally told us that it was going to be the Port Renfrew fire station. Um, and so they just dropped us off there after, and uh, that was it. Well, this is, after all, Canadian history. Um, people are very interested in what's happening here. They want to know what the police are doing here, how we're enforcing this injunction. This is a really difficult situation for reporting. Basically, we're at the mercy of a media liaison to give us access or to not give us access. It's difficult. I know that it's been a difficult journey because um, I don't... You know, we can see that sometimes the desires to document things that are happening and our needs for safety and to be able to protect some of our trade secrets that we have in terms of tools and in terms of our techniques, sometimes those have to be protected. I know the police are anxious to keep the media out of the out of the uh, areas where they are extracting people and they're, so they're demanding that they stay within the exclusion zones. Um, but this, this is not... Um, allowing media proper access and I understand that the Canadian Association of Journalists have now uh, launched a, a legal action against this. Yeah, it's a frustrating situation. Uh, we're often kept too far away from operations to get any reasonable access to photograph those operations. So, uh, and I think most journalists on the ground would identify with that complaint. We're now at the exclusion zone. Uh, there is quite a bit of action going on behind us. There are at least three sleeping dragons. Sleeping dragons refer to protesters who have locked themselves to a tree, cemented themselves in, 
and these massive machinery are now being used to try to remove these protesters. And we've asked for permission to document what's going on, but we aren't allowed past the exclusion line at this point. The machinery is also blocking our access from having a clear understanding of where these protesters are being removed from. And now that we're here, we're waiting at a yellow exclusion line and we're not being permitted access. I, I haven't gotten any photos that are useful today. Uh, I haven't been permitted close enough, so it's sort of symbolic that we're here. It's not actual access. So I'm concerned about this, this exclusion zone and how suddenly, um, you know, we're seeing these kinds of actions and behaviors from the RCMP. Wet'suwet'en had a, a similar uh, kind of approach where the media and observers were, were kept away, where the interpretation of the injunction is being, uh, I would say, stretched quite widely um, by the police and how they're operating. Throughout the protests and the blockades, media have been kept out of the exclusion zone from seeing the arrest firsthand. Uh, this resulted in a court case brought on by the Canadian Association of Journalists as well as other independent media outlets. A hearing was held on July 20th where Justice Thompson agreed with the media that it is an unlawful use of uh, the exclusion zone to block media from seeing what's happening. But despite his ruling, media have still been kept out of the exclusion zone and those who pass are threatened uh, with the possibility of arrest. Um, John Horgan's government in general has been receptive in the fact that they have had to respond to us. And I don't think that anyone in government in their right mind would ignore this. They have to. And I think part of like the deferral process and all of that, whether or not it actually holds any weight, something had to be done. It's for a two-year deferral, but that means that Teal can't have any logging rights in there. And, and actually, in the Ferry Creek deferral, there was only about a kilometre of approved road building, but that opened up uh, the whole headwaters uh, area, and there's a vast amount of more logging that, would, that could have come from there. And there was already one permit for a 10-hectare parcel inside that area uh, that had been applied for, just not approved. So... Um, what didn't, there wasn't that much that it saved that was already approved, but it did set off a bunch, for, at least for the next couple of years from logging. So, so the deferral only covers, as I said, like a, you're, oh, it only covers about a one kilometer of road building. Uh, it doesn't cover a lot of the areas behind waterfall camp, um, behind river camp, where most of the protests have been happening. It doesn't stop the logging, uh, that's approved behind there. So I think if, it seems strange why people are still sort of protesting despite there was the deferral, it's because there wasn't, these a lot of the cut blocks of concern are still available to be cut. Mainstream media really isn't giving the full story. So when you're in Vancouver and you're at your office and you're reading the news and you see that there's this deferral, it's like, oh, it's a win. Old growth is saved, which is not true, but that's the point of having that deferral. And um, fortunately, that wasn't enough and people aren't buying it and they're gonna have to do more. The announcement is a step, but it's not enough. We need so more. Like we need to keep in mind that there's only 2.7% of old growth forests lasting. On the day that, you know, John Horgan was announcing the two-year moratorium Kaiquis was destroyed. The government was promising in their rhetoric to be engaging Indigenous nations about deferrals. They, they were saying that, you know, we're implementing the recommendations of the Old Growth Review Panel. These were the answers that they were giving Sonia and I. Uh, and we're talking to the, to the Indigenous nations about deferring these, uh, these sensitive ecosystems that are at risk of, of uh, biodiversity loss. Um, or complete collapse. A at the same time, the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation was out renewing the forest and range consultation and revenue sharing agreements that entrench the Crown's desire to cut. So they were doing exactly the opposite thing that they were, that they were claiming that they were doing. Two years? No. What's going to happen in two years? A lot of trees are going to be gone, and then there's a provincial election. He'll come to the rescue and say, look, look what I'm doing for you guys. And so I look at it, that's an elec election ploy. 
like we'll talk about having patchy debt and indigenous support but that's that's not the, the that's not really the focus it's a helpful it feels like from from the ndp you know that's a helpful way to legitimize their focus on supporting corporate extraction of resources John Horgan has now sort of used this as a talking point of the importance of this deferral. Uh, yet at the same time, Gikasan and other nations have also asked for deferrals. Squamish. Squamish. Uh, why is this one all of a sudden important and the other one's not? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we've asked exactly that question. If you're going to respect the nation's wishes on deferrals here, uh, Squamish came out publicly uh, and said, they want a deferral on all old growth in all of their territory immediately. And that's been silence in response to that. Uh, there have been nations on Northern Vancouver Island who have been asking for deferrals for years and watched while the trees have come down and no response from government. Now Indigenous nations across the province, the Squamish most recently, have asked for deferrals so that they can develop you know, the resource development plans for their territories. What's going to be really, really interesting is how does the government respond to areas that they don't have any interest in protecting? The other nations that stand up and say that we want to, to have land protected. As you know, the electoral system was introduced to our people when colonization came along. And, um, you know, so now here we have, you know, one group of people that practices the electoral position, which means that we get a new chief every three or four years. And, um, you know, they're reinforcing the policies that were brought along with the colonizers um, to the hereditary chiefs who are born into this position. So they have learned the traditional ways of um, how we should be living. and. That's all that they've been trained for since the day they were born. The Band Council is a uh, Indian Act invented um, group imposed on our bands to govern us. And they were um, supposed to have been an elected council. And it's, it's very difficult to explain the history of it uh, and how we wound up with uh, an unfair um, governance in Canada, which will take a book in itself to explain. And the hereditary chief uh, is um, a custom from our tradition. In the past, uh, we in our cultural uh, system that we had. What we see here today is is not naturally occurring. There's human constructs all over the place. The band councils, uh, chief and councils, are a construct of the Indian Act. Uh, that doesn't mean that there wasn't governance here. In fact, there was really, really sophisticated and beautiful Indigenous governance structures that if we embrace them, we could not only learn a lot about the places that we live and the places that we are, uh, but we would also be able to see the solutions right in front of us. Well, elected band councils, um colonial government, just like our government. Do we really get a say in much? No. They make deals with China and we don't even know the deals, how they work out. Because we don't, we're not privy to that information. Same with the band, the band and council, they can do orders without involving the community. It's called order and council, which is totally wrong. So when they say the patchy dad people, da, 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 no, that's not true at all. It's an elected government no different than ours, with gag orders on them, so it's even worse. Our concern and our ties have been with the Patchadat through Elder Bill Jones. It's his contention that the elected band council of the Patchadat are not representative of the rest of the band members. That, um, that the band council is signing agreements without consulting. They are, they are exercising their authority through orders in council, uh, which apparently relieves them of the, of the necessity of consulting with the rest of the band. I've definitely heard the arguments about, you know, uh, the hereditary chiefs versus the elected chief councillors. I mean, we saw this same situation play out with the Wet'suwet'en in northern British Columbia. 
how do we determine who to listen to within the larger Wet'suwet'en community? Because there were a lot of Wet'suwet'en who were in favor of the pipeline going through, but then there was the hereditary chiefs who were quite adamant that it couldn't. And well, it's even further complicated because of the different clan houses and, and sub-families that make up those clan houses. So that's why I think if we are going to achieve true reconciliation, like I think the government has a point in that right now under Canadian law, uh, the term indigenous governing body, it's, I know it's a colonial construct, but that does recognize the elected band councils. If we're truly to move past that, it has to be an indigenous-led initiative. So governments, just like uh, the general populace, I think owes those nations the time and space to figure out how they want to achieve their governing structure. And ultimately, they're going to be the ones who determine what system works best. For the use of the area, it's theirs. Seven generations down the uh, pipe. We got Patchy Dat youth here, four of them that stay here full time, including the hereditary chief. And he is the hereditary chief. Jeff Jones is the one that got him to cut the ribbon at the school, opening the school as the hereditary chief. Okay, so we're really caught in a crossfire at this point where, you know, our people are saying, you know, who do we follow? You know, because our our band members have been subjected to a lot of, you know, um, a lot of residential school survivor syndrome, so that's the PTSD to, you know, um, the 60s scoop, you know, so now these people are trying to come home, but they're coming home with the colonizing mind thinking, and what are they coming home to? Something else that's more dysfunctional. Uh, the Huayat, Dididat, and Pachidat are now going to be developing integrated resource management plans for their entire territory, for all the resources that, that, come, that come off the land and out of the water. I think this is a really important uh, step forward uh, for sure. I share the passion for wanting to see those old growth stands stay up. But the other part of me is also listening to the voices of the Pachidat, the Dididat, and the Huayat, and especially the Declaration. And there's a very important process that we have to go through with the First Nations on whose traditional territories that we share with them there. And that process, you know, I think we owe it to them to give them the time and space to figure out a way forward. I think when John Horgan says statements like, you know, I want truth and recon reconciliation, he wants it on his terms. He doesn't want it on the terms of the indigenous people. It's very cynical of the provincial government to now have um, revenue sharing agreements that insist that the logging must carry on. You know, BC Timber Sales continues to put old growth forests on the cutting block. And yes, the revenue is being shared with First Nations, but they're not given another op opportunity. There is no other option that's being provided. The cut block just over the hill has been approved. The corporate interests are ready to saw. So you're either going to get a small amount of economic benefit from that activity, or you're not. As the former Minister of Forests and Lands, Doug Donaldson said, the former NDP minister, as he said, these are take it or leave it agreements. You can take the money that we're offering, or you can leave it and get nothing. And for Indigenous nations who have been deliberately cut out through government policy out of the economic equation, what are you to do? Like, it, it, it is not a free and prior consent relationship that the Premier wants to hide behind. When you look at Vancouver Island, 150 years of colonization here, if you think about the old growth forests as a banquet table, there's crumbs left at the table and it's only been in recent years that First Nations have been invited to the table. And that is unethical and immoral. So, you know, that, that uh, now it's like, help us help us devour the last little bit, rather than leaving anything for future generations. Forcing the First Nations to um, give up their land so they may be liquidated, the colonial extractivist resource extraction, is not really um, how we preserve heritage and culture. Well, first of all, this is Indigenous lands, and, you know, I could, because <laughs> we have it. Just the whole colonization of Indigenous people has put them in this position in my, that's my thoughts, um, of having to sell something so precious and 
who they are and their spirit to people who are going to cut them down to make money for other people. I just... They also made a decision that they were going to frame this in, a, in, in the light that the only thing that the Indigenous nation would accept is cutting those trees. Because that's the agreement that they signed, was to cut the trees. However, they never put on the table alternatives. They never said, let's put some, as Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs said, let's put some conservation financing in place. Let's use the mechanisms that were successful to protect the Great Bear Rainforest. Let's, let's try those. This wasn't a discussion about options. This was a discussion about entrenching the Crown forestry policy, which was to cut. When a nation is given one choice, that's not a choice. Right? And the choice is, you know, with these benefit agreements, this activity is going to happen. Your choice is you sign on and agree to it and see some benefit from it, or you don't, and it still happens. This is not reconciliation. This is so far from reconciliation. This is a common story between Indigenous nations all across North America, is the government has put us between a rock and a hard place, where it's like, we have oppressed you so greatly that, you know, we're going to give you this lucrative offer where you can get money to help your people, but you have to give up the last bit of land that we sectioned off to you at the start of colonization. And we, you know, they strong arm us into it and because they have no choice. So I can understand, like, from, you know, Chief's point of view, like, he's got to care for his people, but he has to give up the integrity of the land. And just a greater understanding of that. That's what so many so many nations across North America are going through right now. And that self-realization and sensitivity to our surroundings has always been numbed, like war veterans or the like there where people are shoved into a ghetto, which in fact is what a reservation is, you know. It's a government-imposed ghetto where everyone is squashed together and that of course is not healthy for any culture to be uh, restricted in their movements. When it's all said and done, what do you have left? And, and this is where conservation financing, the opposite approach to this would be to say, you know, here's the wealth, here's the funding so that we can conserve what's here and create economic opportunities. And now I think our um, band council is uh, starting to realize they're stuck on the bandwagon and maybe uh, they want to get off but they can't. They've signed contracts that they can't get out of and are now using perhaps uh, like the contract that is signed they said okay the Teal Jones said you're going to um, Keep your band members gagged. You're going to stop them from going out and actively uh, prepare, uh, protecting the forest. Now that is a, a coercion, I feel. The band council was coerced into signing that. Truth and reconciliation, not here. Not from this government. Like. You know, you see the dirty tactics with the politicians coordinating the emails uh, with the band council, like, and then they're in a rough spot too. Like nothing, nothing saying nothing bad against Jeff Jones because they've signed non-disclosure agreements and they have to have to participate with the band on dissension, like with the government on dissension within their own band. Uh, those agreements in themselves fly in the face of truth and reconciliation. Well, basically that there's an agreement in place, they signed for that money and uh, they have to, it's a, they can't talk about it. They're not allowed to speak about it. And if anybody speaks out in their band against it, they're to coordinate with the government to help the narrative. So the government has actually been putting out press releases on behalf of, of the band? In coordination is the way they're supposed to, like, it's just, it's not right. It's not right. But the disproportionate portion goes ten, and tending towards the um, Teal Jones and other corporations 
who, you know, take a huge chunk of the money and they keep it for themselves, right? Out of the, the whopping profits that Teal Jones makes, um, this year, a new forest sharing revenue agreement has been signed with the Pachadat, and $242,000 will go to them this year, which is a paltry amount when you consider the, the profits that Teal Jones is making. In their injunction against the Rainforest Flying Squad, uh, Teal Jones has testified that we are blocking them from approximately $9 million worth of old growth. This is all contained in some 200 hectares. So it's still a very small area, but that's $9 million worth of profit to them. Uh, Two million of that then goes to the government in terms of stumpage fees. 242,000 then goes to the Patchadat First Nation. Um, then on top of Teal Jones' um, take on that, they add another, um, process by processing all of those logs they add another value of that of another 10 million dollars so they're getting 20 million dollars out of this that goes to the company it doesn't go to the local communities it obviously doesn't go to the patch of that and and little is returned to the government then in terms of you know what they claim is necessary revenue for schools and hospitals i mean that barely covers anything that's just on the old growth so we're not talking about the second growth harvesting that they're still making oodles of money off of the patchy dad have a sawmill they have to pay stumpage fees on their own damn territory which is criminal uh, as far as and then you follow the money so you know, I heard from councillors before that the 2017 agreement they signed with the province, they were never properly paid out on that, and it was pennies. Pennies on the dollar, that one. Then you look at the latest one, so they got paid 277000 on the first year and 35000 on the years following, two years following, which is peanuts. Peanuts. When one of these trees is worth $35,000, one tree, and they're taking out hundreds of acres. Uh, they'll have it logged out in five years if we don't stand up. Uh, one mountain sold in Washington state, 200 kilometers south of here for 4.3 million US dollars. That didn't include the riparian zones they had to leave. It was just a partial piece of 180 acres. 180 acres is the size of the Apache Dot Village. So they've easily taken 10 times out that amount out last year. And when you realize they didn't get paid for it, or they got 277,000 and 35,000 a year, you start thinking, what the fuck? We actually need to settle the outstanding debt financially on First Nations land. And um, that isn't about giving them $242,000 to log 132 million off of their territory or thereabouts. This is about preserving the land and creating a perpetual source of income for the Apache Dat so they may preserve their culture for future generations. Yeah, you mentioned the cost of that the government makes approximately $2 million mm -hmm. from destroying this watershed. Uh, once you factor in the cost of the protests, mm -hmm. the cost of the police, the cost of the court system, how much do you think is being spent versus of the taxpayer dollar versus how much is being recouped? I, I would suspect that all of that $2 million that goes to government would be would have evaporated by now and all of those assorted costs. So yeah, the taxpayer is again bearing the brunt of this and and unnecessarily so. How much do you think this has cost so far? Like what, we're in day 29 of enforcement? Helicopters, like it's, it actually really pisses me off that that's what I'm paying taxes for right now. Like I would rather be ta paying taxes for studies and re-education and, um, just the a renewed forestry practices. You know, I don't know the cost. One could only imagine that there is probably a significant cost to something like this. However, there are provisions within the policing budget in British Columbia that are given to police to deal with these types of things. They do plan for things like wildfires, 
um, you know, industry um, issues, different community issues. So um, in terms of it being budgeted, I don't know where it would fall within the expenditure that we've been given, but there are provisions made in budgets to help us deal with things as they come up, whether they're emergencies like a natural disaster like a fire or floods, or whether they are things that have to do with conflict between industry and the community. Not, I don't know of any of the specifics, but generally I can imagine it's quite high. I mean, I know what the cost of a, of a uniformed officer is in terms of just salary, but the fact that they're sending those members all of that specialized equipment uh, plus their vehicles, I'm sure that the tally is running up pretty high right now. Yeah, it's been massively costly for uh, both for the movement and the movement supporters. Uh, very successful fundraising, but that's a lot of money from communities to support that. Uh, and then also for the RCMP, for example, you know, very rough numbers, but with the amount of officers that are on site, often it seems like there's over 20 officers per day being deployed for arrests. A lot of them are traveling from other areas, uh, put up in hotels, probably working overtime. Then there's different officers on night at night, plus increased staffing at Lake Cowichan and probably other points. So it's it's uh, you know I, I would you know between 50 and 100 thousand a day I would expect on policing costs. Plus you know for teal they've definitely lost revenue from timber. Timber prices are really high right now. Um, and their legal fees are going to be immense. They're probably, you know, close to 100000 a month, I, I, I would expect. They've got just a team of lawyers working full time. Um, so it's, a, it's a hugely costly for everyone. And it's interesting because the cost, the, the value of some of the cut blocks aren't that big in themselves. Um, but it's just kind of a locked in conflict at this point, it seems like. It's getting close to it, you know, right now it's just like right under that line and um, I'm believing that, you know, by the time, you know, they deal with everybody, you know, which could take another six months, so that puts it, you know, 2021 will be the year that Fairy Creek will still keep standing, will still keep fighting for what we um, are defending. Um, I believe that the cost will be far more. It's going to cost more. It's going to be more than $2 million for sure. And, and this is the part that I don't understand. Like, I don't understand the logic here. Because right at the outset, the province has all the tools and all the power it needs to solve this right now. And they're not doing it. They're not using those tools and they're not using that power. And it's, it's a shameful level of irresponsibility that they're showing. It's shameful. Teal Jones has asked for uh, the provincial crown to take over prosecution and f as of the contempt of court charges as criminal contempt. And uh, I understand that um, Teal Jones now is making application to lay the, the costs of those prosecutions on the court, i.e. the government and the taxpayer. They don't want to pony up the court costs, in other words, of prosecuting over 300 people. I mean, I'm sure that will kind of dig into their profit margins a little. So we will have to see if the court actually will allow them to do that. And all signs indicate that they're going to take on prosecution. Yeah, so if the, if the, uh, if the Crown takes over, it's, uh, the public's going to be paying for essentially Teal's uh, legal fees in enforcing because they will have, uh, they'll be paying the legal bills for all prosecuting the arrestees, whereas up to now Teal's had to pay that. Um, so the public will be paying both to kind of charge people and do that process and then also to enforce the injunction. Because the policing costs are not being, you know, paid for by the corporate interest, you know, because at some point the corporate interest would be like, no, no, if, if they had to pay for it, they'd say, no, we're good. We're going to go log somewhere else because it's going to cost us more to enforce the injunction than for us to, uh, that we're going to make. Uh, but because the taxpayer of British Columbia is going to be on the hook for this, you know, at some point the, the, the cost of enforcing this injunction is going to be greater than the provincial government makes on this cut block. It's shocking to me that we are spending the amount of money we are on enforcement um, to protect a small segment of the population, which is industry, to do this thing that affects 
everyone rather than using those resources to just rethink how we do forestry. I mean, we've had four decades of people talking about this and nothing has changed um, because it's easier to just let the social movements get tired, move on to other things. When they stop being so loud, then they can go back to business as usual. If, if the loggers had it their way, yes, you know, they, all the trees would be gone. But then there are just a handful of loggers who are slowly, you know, opening up their hearts and their minds to um, hearing the words of the people on the blockades who are saying, now I see what you're talking about, now I understand. And, you know, I think they could be, you know, easily persuaded if, you know, if their income was guaranteed, you know, for the next five years, that, you know, okay, let's do some job training, let's invest in your future, let's, you know, get you um, planting some trees, let's get you cultivating um, hope for a better tomorrow for not only uh, your family, but the entire community. This is not about pitting ourselves against the loggers. Listen, the loggers and ourselves, we're just pawns here, right? We're just pawns. The real players behind this are the government, the unions, and the companies, right? The loggers and ourselves, we're pawns being moved around on the board. Um, so let's be respectful with each other. We've got a difference of opinion that has yet to be adequately resolved at the level that it needs to be resolved. That's where we're stuck. We're pro-loggers. We understand that the Pachidat and Dididat people, like Port Renfrew, depends on logging. We just need to make it sustainable. That is the biggest thing. And there is ways to make it sustainable. There's no reason in this world that we have to cut down our ancestors. You know, these trees have been here for over 10 generations and have given life and given the air that we breathe to so many generations. And we, our brains are so small and can't even comprehend the life that those trees, our ancestors, have lived. And we have no right to take that away. We are not going against the entire logging industry right now. Um, that's a huge issue, it's another issue. This issue is specifically to protect the trees that are left of ancient temperate rainforests, which is a really tiny and specific amount of ecosystem that houses endangered animals. And um, the loggers have often been agreeing with us because they themselves have a connection to the forest. They have been coming and saying how proud they are to be able to say that they live in the forest and work in the forest and they love it just as much as we do. So we're not trying to take away their livelihood, livelihoods. We're trying to make their work sustainable. And in a world in 10, 20 years from now, if we just cut all these trees now, then what's left for them? Oh, loggers, no problem. The patchy that sawmill, those guys aren't against us. They can't, they, they're not against us. Just keep the road clear so they can get their trucks through. And we're not against them. But it's something that maybe not everyone is understanding, so it can create tensions. Um, personally, when when we get out of the police office, we got a pro-logger protest that was against us. And we have been like yelled at like obscenities by those people. Um, it was hard, but I s understand why there's this reaction. I just want to try to make it clear that it's not against them. It's really for the trees. We're not anti-logging at all. You know, there's lots of uh, available second growth harvest that should be available in the tree farm license. Um, if the forest industry has planted uh, as they said they should, or, and so those harvests should be available now. And logging intelligently and sustainably is not only economical, but it's, it's, it, it's going to keep work long term. We have lots of abandoned logging camps. There's three or four here in the uh, San Juan Valley and up the Gordon River also. And if our forest industry was really oriented towards the livelihood of loggers, we wouldn't see the data that we see over the last decade or so, particularly on Vancouver Island, where the annual allowable cut has gone up and the number of jobs has gone down. And so industry has become more and more mechanized 
It takes fewer and fewer people to remove those trees. It's also worth noting that in 2019, at the same time as they were firing 800 employees in British Columbia, Teal Jones moved to Virginia, where they spent $132 million acquiring two private sawmills so that they could continue expanding their private wealth on the other side of the border, while at the same time leaving 800 forestry workers with no means of future employment. We could be cutting down a lot fewer trees and have a lot more jobs if there was a, a requirements by industry as put in place by government, this is a, this is a public resource and here's how you're allowed to use it. Um, but in fact, what we've had decade over decade is a lessening of that. And what this really is about is extracting profit. They're also not even putting in place the, the programs to support these workers in transition. So, so they're saying, well, we can't just stop it now because you know, because these people need these jobs tomorrow. It's like, well, at some point in the very, very near future, we're going to be at this spot anyway. And if we don't support those workers in transition today, they will be standing with, with nothing left to cut in a very few short years from now. And we will have done nothing to protect the old growth. And we will have done nothing to protect the people that were benefiting from that industry. And we'll all be standing around thinking, well, that wasn't very smart. You know, it's absolutely immoral to uh, destroy a whole forest, a whole life, a whole ecosystem, which our government has systematically done since we set the, since when white man settled. And of course, I just went along with it. I thought that was great, setting trophies in camp, and I could buy a car, I could get drunk, I could have enough to feed on until payday. And uh, then the bosses in camp used to say, don't worry, Bill, you're going to be logging forever. We're going to be going round and round in circle here forever. You're never going to run out of a job. And the, that lasted about 20 years, 25 years. And I was laid off forever. So if this was really about jobs, we wouldn't be clear-cutting. We'd be doing selective logging. That's going to be a lot more jobs. We would make sure that every piece of wood is processed and manufactured and value-added. If this was about jobs, uh, there are many, many ways that we can achieve far more jobs with far fewer trees than we are doing right now. This is about profit. The fact is that Nobody needs to lose jobs. In fact, there's more jobs in restoration. There's more jobs in having the forest standing, whether it's, it's recreation, um, education, um, spiritual um, needs, um, health and well-being. There's a lot of opportunity um, within the forest. And um, one prime example of that is the Wildwood Ecoforest. I'm on the board of the Ecoforestry Institute Society, and we own and operate uh, Wildwood Ecoforest. It's been harvested since 1945, still a, a standing forest. And now we have developed a business model where we can include education and tourism and, and all sorts of associated um, uh, activities and, and while creating jobs and while creating revenue without having to cut the forest. Let's have, you know, a five-year moratorium and let's um, do some retraining of some of those loggers who already know the woods, they already know the terrain, why not get them converted over to replanting? I would say get the industry retooling um, for smaller wood and to move to value-added. That's it in a nutshell. That's all they need to do. And you know, not all logs, but a lot of logs are being shipped out of British Columbia and off of this island raw. You just have to go to the terminal in Nanaimo to see that. In a recent report released by Focus on Victoria, David Broadlin published June 29th, 2021, and through the research of the BC Ministry of Forests, 52% of the forestry in uh, British Columbia turns into wood waste, what is considered wood chips or sawdust, which is then turned into toilet paper, newsprint, or garden mulch. That means one out of every two old growth trees in British Columbia that is cut down is turned into waste products. 
tourism Vancouver Island right now is is selling this this dream of Vancouver Island that is absolutely uh, kind of antithetical to the one that actually the reality of the world that we live in. You know, we're getting eco tourism companies now that are that are um, in dire straits because now they can't. Um, operate their businesses because the RCMP won't let them through uh, their roadblocks. Uh, these are public roads. I mean, that's unconscionable that one industry has to be sacrificed for the benefit of another. Tourism is a very important uh, part of this area um, and people come up here just to see these trees and if we take that away, um, there's not going to be a reason for people to come walk around devastated cut blocks. Ecotourism lodges and, and uh all of those things that bring people from around the world who pay top dollar to go into that pristine wilderness. Imagine the, the capacity to say, come to Port Renfrew, you know, stay on Pachydat territory and be led by Pachydat people into one of the world's last intact ancient forests. So when you're looking at whether it's the BC Green Party, the Federal Green Party, the BC NDP or the Federal NDP, we all have our different jurisdictions that we're looking out for on behalf of our constituents based on which legislature we actually have seats in. Well, I've been asking the federal government to, to speak with the, the First Nations and with uh, the provincial government. The federal budget, just there was just $2.3 billion put into the federal bu budget for the Nature Legacy initiative, which is to set aside 25% of the land base and 25% of the marine base by 2025. Federally, the tools uh, at first glance can seem like they're quite limited, but one of the, uh, the most important federal programs that exists out there is some, a program called the Nature Legacy Program. One of their great commitments has been a commitment to try and increase the protected land mass of Canada to 30% by the year, I think, 2025. And I think one of the ways that the federal government can work in this particular situation is to look at Indigenous-led initiatives where we're trying to create a conservation economy, realizing that these old-growth stands are worth more standing up than they are being cut down for their timber value, and have the federal government come in, work with those Indigenous-led initiatives to protect these old-growth stands as a part of the larger federal initiative. If this is a job interview for John Horgan to have some um, next level corporate executive position where um, he clearly can support only corporate interests and respond zero to what the effects of those interests are on the public, then he's doing a really good job. Like he's, I feel like he's actually doing that right now, like proving to the corporate world that he can the line. They're all friends. John Horgan and uh, the management of uh, Teal Jones are personal friends and uh, so, and you know friends and they uh, look after each other. They've been friends for 40 years or 50 years and since they were kids so they uh, they stick together. How do you know that? Um, because Horgan comes up to our functions here with Jeff. They go out fishing together, things like that. Well, so far what I've seen of the NDP government is uh, that they have really close ties and with United Steelworkers Union, with the Truck Loggers Association, with the BC uh, Council of Forest Industries. So they have declared their alliance. Portions of the effort here are in his riding. And he's just, he's so, so absent. He's completely avoided dealing or even in any way interfacing, addressing, responding to what's going on here. And it can only be, it can only come down to corruption. There's so many stories about how corrupt our system is right now. British Columbians should absolutely be cynical. Because all the government has to do is issue a minister's directive. It costs nothing in order to save the forest. So they could do that right now. They could stop it at the drop of a hat, uh, just stop old growth logging within TFL 46. And it wouldn't 
affect the uh, majority of the operations there even. It's just a portion of the operations. Um, but they haven't chosen to do that, so the public's paying a lot of money out uh, because of that. We did, of course, reach out to John Horgan's NDP government and its ministers to participate in this documentary, including Katrine Conroy, Minister of Forestry, Murray Rankin, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, as well as David Eby, Minister of Justice. All three declined to participate or refused to acknowledge the invitation. What's happening with the NDP in that they won't talk about it, they won't engage, they won't acknowledge their responsibility and the burden that they have in this, in creating this situation and also refusing to solve it. And the, the kind of message box communications is actually, in my opinion, inflaming the situation. People know when they're not being told the truth. People know when somebody's giving them, you know, a comms message box. I work for the government. I'm embarrassed. I have been, I can't even believe I'm going to say this on camera, I've been, I voted NDP since I could crack a vote. I've done door-to-door -door campaigns and never, ever again, never. Mm. He lied. It was one of the reasons we voted again on that platform, to save old growth, and he, he lied. Uh, we make phone calls, we send emails, there's no reply, there's nothing. And the accountability is zero. We can continue to get trapped in the narrative that I have to vote for them because they're so bad. But we also have to wake up to the fact that we've heard that so often. We, we have now voted uh, for the, the less worst option, I guess is the way to put it. And what do we get? Exactly the same policy. Our political system has encouraged and rewarded political parties uh, to make decisions that are not to the benefit of the public, but to the benefit of their parties. And more and more it feels like people get elected and then they represent their parties to the public, as opposed to representing the public inside the legislature or inside parliament. And we're, we're not equipped right now. Our current approach to politics and governance will fail because the, the practice of our governance is far too imbued with partisanship and, and political motivation. John Horgan, I would like you to do the right thing. Do the right thing. Why are you not listening to the people that voted you in and doing what your people want? It's just undemocratic and we're supposed to be in Canada in beautiful BC and it's just a total lie. I just tell him to stop. I would I would take him up for a walk and I would I would tell him to sit with our grandfather and our grandmothers and just sit there and just sit there and think about what he's doing, what life he's taking away and for what. You know, a bit of money. Open your heart. I don't have the language to speak to him because I speak with my heart and I'm not a part of that world. And it seems unfair that as a person, like living in this country, we're so separated from the people that control it. Our system doesn't have heart anymore and we don't look after the land that we have settled on and I would yeah, I asked John Horgan to stop this old growth logging, move towards more sustainable second, third growth logging, um, selective logging, which in fact employs more people than old growth logging, um, and to in implement the 14 recommendations of the, the forest protection plan. But he could be known for something amazing, like saving those old growth forests. He could be known as the one that helped to save the future of the next generations. So, just keep that in mind, John Horgan. Not the people in this building. They do not represent us. The province is not going to do this. They never have. And we have to look at different models of 
land management governance, and it has to be co-governance, has to be Indigenous-led, and we have to get there very quickly. I believe the public pressure is big enough that the um, ancient temperate rainforest will be saved here. I hope that just not on the South Island here, but in all of BC, old growth logging is banned and we invest in First Nations communities, alternatives to old growth logging and sustainable forestry. So my hope is that this is going to send a message that somebody's got to step in and do the right thing, just do the right thing and stop this before we lose it. And we can't get this back. An immediate moratorium on any further logging of original forest, especially in the most biologically important areas. I mean, ideally in a dream world, I would love for it to just stop. Just, just stop. It's the last 2.7%. Just leave it alone. Save the old growth. It's all you need to do. You know, th there's no more need for study, no more need for panels. It's just time to issue the minister's directive, stop cutting the old growth. Not, not a deferral, but just an end to old growth, logging a moratorium on it. Um, and it's definitely within the NEP's policy uh, basket or whatever. They could do that if they wanted to. Uh, it would be difficult because there is a lot of invested uh, uh, rights for companies, but they'd be able to uh, they could n navigate that process. It would take a bit of time, but they could do that. What we decide today impacts all of the future. We have a responsibility as Canadians, uh, as human beings, to protect this ecosystem. I also think that, um, you know, we live in this era of so-called reconciliation, and reconciliation is meaningless if we don't find a way to live um, and care for the land. It has to recognize that the land will ultimately treat us the way we treat it. We're respecting the trees by protecting them. In protecting the trees, we learn how to like respect and protect each other, and we're all equal. Realize that we're not working on reconciliation. Reconciliation means going back to something that was good. And there was never anything good. So. That has to be a restructuring rather than reconciliation meeting. I think that a lot of it is much bigger than us. Um, we're here doing a lot of like micro things, but on the, on the macro scale, um, this is going to be putting a lot of pressure on the government, on the legal systems, and it's amazing to see the amount of support we have, and they're going to have to change. The actions that we do on any blockade, whether it's Ferry Creek or whether it's for the missing and murdered or if it's for the children who never made it home, it's about the community. Not just myself, not just you, it is about the whole community. And so we're looking at preserving the future. And we can keep putting up these blockades to buy more time and they can keep being torn down. Um, and we can keep playing this game. Not that it is any means of a game, it's very serious, but sometimes it also seems a little silly that we have to fight for this. We have so many emergencies right now. So climate emergency, biodiversity collapse. We have a housing emergency. We have an inequality emergency. We have a, a toxic drug supply emergency really a, a, a growing crisis in public education that will turn into an emergency if we continue to have a scarcity approach to public education. We have a racism and intolerance emergency, really, that is growing. I'm glad that we have this dawning realization of the emergency of, of, of Indigenous peoples in this country. Um, but the emergency around really changing uh, the future of, of our country, so that reconciliation is at the center of it, has to be seen as such an urgent job. So, and then at the very top of this was failure of our governance systems and institutions. This is the new reality. This is what it's going to look like, um, that these kinds of protests and these kinds of act, uh, activism is going to be more frequent in North America. I don't know, my hope is that it continues to build and people start taking actions in cities and that we can, you know, continue to disrupt society in a way that um, is unbearable 
uh, for for the government to tolerate at, at a certain point. And that's like my hope for all um, civil disobedience actions that are against, you know, colonial extractivist projects like this. It's time for the common person to stand up. If we don't do it, we are going to see more and more uh, instances of Ferry Creek and Wet'suwet'en and, you know, happening everywhere because um, because it's not just Indigenous nations that know that it's wrong. There's a huge uh, uh, segment of the population that is pretty grossed out by what's happening. And it, 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 really, it really resonated uh, after the discovery at, uh, at, resident, at the residential school in Kamloops that there is a significant population that will accept nothing other than doing what's right. For the past 11 months, the Rainforest Flying Squad has been lined up against Teal Jones, the courts, the RCMP, and the NDP government. After 11 months, we are still here and we are not going anywhere. This is the last, um, the last stand for these trees. As folks have been saying, these trees are worth more standing.